In the late 80s and early 90s, the makers of Dungeons and Dragons decided to make comic books? Great Scott! I know, this is heavy. Hey there adventurers, I'm Judd. Welcome back to Short Rest Studios. The history of TSR is pretty fascinating. There was so much creativity and artistry and so many boneheaded decisions. One of the company's most fascinating and frustrating eras is the formation of TSR West. Now later on in this video, I'm gonna talk about how the TSR of that era parallels the Hasbro Watsi of today. But for now, fire up your flux capacitor. We're heading back to the 80s. <laughs> That was so dumb. In the late 80s, TSR had licensed a bunch of its properties to DC Comics. There was an AD&D book, Forgotten Realms, Spelljammer, all of the, a bunch more, so all published by DC. And now they weren't top tier comics. We're not talking like Batman level sales or anything, but they were doing pretty well. According to Ben Riggs' book, Slaying the Dragon, A Secret History of Dungeons and Dragons, which is a great book, I highly recommend it. I will put a link to it in the description if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet. Please do. These comics were selling about as well as Wonder Woman at the time, which was not amazing, but it was nothing to sneeze at. So TSR and DC had a fruitful partnership. They were making a little money. New audiences were theoretically being exposed to D&D, but then TSR leadership made one of those baffling decisions that seems to have defined the entire life of the company. They decided to start their own comics imprint. Maybe they saw this as the answer to slipping sales. Maybe they realized it's easier to adapt a comic book to film and television, which was something that had always been on the company's radar, D&D cartoon series, anyone, than it was to adapt a role-playing game. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy. You've got experts in the business actively making comic books for you and you decide, nah, I'm gonna make my own. TSR actually brought together people with actual relevant experience to create a business plan for TSR West, which would be a division of the company based in California that was gonna produce comics and pursue, 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 and pursue TV and movie deals. Now, of course they couldn't produce any D&D related comics content because that was licensed to DC. Maybe that should have been the first red flag. By all reports, the plan they came up with was a good one. Maybe it would have worked if, you know, they'd actually followed it. See, almost immediately, TSR leadership started chopping this plan to bits. Instead of making comic books, the folks at TSR West were now tasked with creating comic modules. What the heck is a comic module? Well, see, DC was a little ticked off about this whole thing. In fact, maybe ticked off enough to start investigating lawsuits for breach of contract. No, 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 we're, we're not making comic books. We had a few pages with stuff like stat blocks or campaign setting material, maybe a mini game. It's a comic module. We're not competing with DC. So the California division got to work making these comic modules. There was RIP, a horror comic, sorry, comic module. There was Warhawks, a sci-fi time travel comic module. And let's not forget Buck Rogers. Yeah, yeah, Buck Rogers. Hold that thought. So remember those fairly successful D&D comics? DC canceled them. All of them. When I was researching for this video, I came across a cool little blog called DC in the 80s. And back in June 2020, this blog featured a post about the DC TSR comic lines. And one of the comments on that post is from James Louder, who was in the TSR book department at the time all this was going down. Check out what he said. The root cause for the line cancellation was DC turning down the option to publish a Buck Rogers comic book. What about Buck? Now, Lorraine Williams, who was the CEO and owner of TSR at the time all this was happening, is quite often villainized in TSR history, and sometimes rightly so, sometimes not. But this is one of those cases where the decisions she led the company to were, I mean, questionable at best. See, Williams, she was the owner of TSR, right? And CEO, well, her, her family 
owned the copyright to Buck Rogers. Now, I remember seeing TSR Buck Rogers games and I thought, man, that's really cool. But I was literally the one person in the world who cared about Buck Rogers, except apparently for Lorraine Williams. DC didn't want to do a Buck Rogers comic, so Williams had TSR start its own comic book company. And this, again, is just one of a whole litany of short-sighted, self-serving decisions that she apparently made as the head of TSR. So that's two crappy decisions at the root of TSR West, but maybe the modules were good. Maybe people wanted to get their hands on them. Maybe retailers knew what to do with them. No, not, not really. Two things really stood in the way of TSR West's success. The first was that despite in some cases actually having quality talent like Marv Wolfman involved, the books just weren't any good. And add to that the fact that absolutely nobody knew what to do with the books. Like nobody, like not TSR, not the creators, not the retailers, nobody. See, remember they, they weren't comic books. They were comic modules. They were games. These days, a lot of comic shops are first game shops. But in the early 90s, comic shops didn't sell games. People who shopped there were there to buy comics. So comics retailers didn't want to stock them. A lot of towns didn't have comic shops like the town I grew up in, but everybody had a, a mall with a bookstore and there was usually a spinner rack with comics in it. But book retailers put the comic modules in the game section with the other TSR stuff. So that new audience of comic readers didn't find them and not many gamers were interested. And this, guys, this this is my favorite. As a longtime comics collector, I actually had a very visceral response to this when I first read it. Sometimes the game content in the modules required you to cut things out of the pages. Like, it hurts. It hurt. It actually hurts me. I know you're telling me, TSR, that these aren't comic books, but they look like comic books and they they smell like comic books. They're comic books and you don't tell a comics collector to cut up their comics. That's insane. I get mad just thinking about it. TSR West opened its doors around 1989 and it was shut down in 1991. And this whole debacle was just one of a series of terrible corporate decisions that led to the ultimate failure of TSR as a company until it was bought by Wizards of the Coast in 1997. So what are the parallels that I see between late 80s TSR and today's Hasbro Watsi? Well, there's the obvious obsession with expanding their IP into film and television and that may or may not be a good thing. I mean, it's fine, but I think their approach actually shows there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the IP on the part of Hasbro Wizards. I don't think TSR really understood what they had back then, and I don't think Hasbro understands what they have now. D&D is great, and in the last 10 years or so, it's entered the mainstream, but if for no other reason than the inherent complexity of role-playing games, it's never going to be Monopoly mainstream. And I think that's one of the reasons we haven't seen D&D succeed in other media like like film. And then there's this idea that Hasbro Watsi keeps pushing of D&D being under monetized and, and this focus on the digital. They just don't know what they have. The other parallel I see is this one, and it's not necessarily something that comes across in the TSR West story, but it does. If you look at the overall history of TSR, the brand is more important than the people. TSR employed tons of talented game designers, authors, artists, I mean, people that we look back on as the icons in the field, but leadership always seemed to think that these people were just a dime a dozen. They never paid them what they were worth. They didn't let artists retain their originals, which was is standard practice. They thought D&D &D made the people, but it was the people who made D&D. Hasbro last year laid off almost 2,000 people, and among those were a lot of Wizards employees who were involved in D&D. The OGL enabled a lot of third-party publishers to profit from Dungeons & Dragons, but the amazing community that embraces D&D that exists even now 
was made possible in part by those third-party publishers. The IP would not be what it is without those creators, and the Hasbro WotC tried to undercut them with a revised OGL. D&D isn't anything without the artists, designers, writers, third-party creators, dungeon masters, and players who make it and play it. 